Hi, my name is Hank Bryant and I'm here today at the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge to learn more about the conservation issues here surrounding the Blanding's turtle. Here at the top of the observation tower, we have a fantastic view of the expanse of Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. These wetlands are home to many birds, amphibians, and reptiles, including this red-winged blackbird here. But our focus for today is, of course, on the Massachusetts Blanding's turtle. Uh, I'm here with Brian Windmiller. Thanks for coming, Brian. You're welcome. Uh, he's the executive director of the Grassroots Wildlife Program. Conservation. Right? Conservation. So could you tell us a little bit about what you do in your daily life? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a herpetologist, so I'm a biologist who works mostly with amphibians and reptiles. Mm -hmm. Though um, I'm interested in rare species in general. and. Um, uh, what we do at Grassroots Wildlife Conservation is we work on rare species conservation projects and we do it in a way that involves um, people who live in the same communities as the, the species we work with. And we work with um, a few different species right now. We've got a program with Blanding's turtles that I guess mm -hmm. we'll talk about today. Well, all of the turtles in Massachusetts are, um, as a general rule, all, all of the turtles in Massachusetts have certainly gotten a lot less common than they were in the past. And in the state, there are eight species of turtles that occur inland, so outside of sea turtles. And um, of those, really only two species are still common, painted turtles and snapping turtles. Blanding's turtles are one of the rarest species, so Blanding's turtles would probably make it statewide as perhaps the second rarest species. Uh, they're listed in Massachusetts as a threatened species. And um, just as a little background to them, it would be great if we had a turtle here, but Blanding's turtles, the adults get to be about eight inches across their shell, so they get to be about this big. They're decent sized turtles, they weigh about four pounds as adults. Um, they've got a big high top shell, carapace, it's quite dark. And the way that you can tell them immediately if you see them is they've got a bright yellow chin and throat. Mm. So bright yellow across here, not stripes like painted turtles have, but just bright yellow chin and throat. Uh, in Massachusetts, there are probably fewer than 2,000 adult Blanding's turtles statewide. Mm. Uh, there's one population that has probably at least 600 adults in it. And then there are only a couple, three other populations that have even 50 adults or more that mm. we know of right now. So here at Great Meadows, um, in the habitat that's behind us, in these big um, ponds at Great Meadows, on the fringes of them, there's probably about 50 adult Blanding's turtles that live here now. And that's down a lot from what had been here. So biologists had studied the same population here at Great Meadows in the early 1970s. At that time, uh, they estimated that there were about 115 adult Blanding's turtles. So only we now only have about 40% of uh, what were here 40 years ago. One of the biggest problems is simply that turtles get killed on the roads at high levels. Blanding's turtles are turtles that, even though they're mostly aquatic, they mostly live in water, um, with their big high shell, they're very capable and adept at staying on and moving across the land. And they characteristically wander a lot between one wetland and another. The females here at Great Meadows and in eastern Massachusetts generally don't breed until they get to pretty close to 20 years of age. Wow. The males just a little bit younger in their later teens. and. They lay relatively few eggs at a time. Sometimes they take a year off. They live a long time. Mm -hmm. So adult Blanding's turtles can easily live into their 60s and 70s. But what it means is that if even a few adults get killed each year on a road, say, then the population is likely not going to be able to sustain that over the long term. Blanding's turtles really depend on 
very particular kinds of wetlands. They like wetlands that have really dense vegetation um, where they can hide, they can stay in cover and have access to the food that they like to eat. And that kind of open marsh habitat has also gotten rarer. When they nest, the baby turtles, the eggs, are very vulnerable to predators. And in fact, in the wild, it's typical for Blanding's turtles and for other turtles to lose most of their eggs before they ever hatch to predators. Around here, the main predators are raccoons and skunks, foxes to a lesser extent. And all three of those species have gotten much more common in recent decades. People can always ask that question, why does it matter? And in truth, one obvious thing that's important to say is that the world would go on if Blanding's turtles disappeared, that humankind would go on, that as far as we can tell, there would be no ecological calamity. But it's important to remember that Blanding's turtles are one species that lives in a web of other species. In this area, Great Meadows, which has a bunch of rare species, has several rare birds, for example. Um, Blanding's turtles are just one component, and Blanding's turtles interact to a great extent with all the other species here. And if you think of maybe expand the, the viewpoint beyond turtles, beyond Blanding's turtles, to say turtles in general, turtles here as elsewhere certainly have a really big ecological role to play. In these two big ponds behind us, for example, there are probably about, and this is our estimates from trapping in here, around four or 5,000 individual turtles that you can find here at any given time. And those are decent sized animals. Painted turtles about this size, Blanding's turtles about like that, a few spotted turtles left, and then quite a few snapping turtles, which can get this size. And all of those turtles collectively have a huge impact on the ecology of this wetland. They affect it tremendously. We don't know, as scientists, it's far beyond our capacity to really understand exactly how that is. But I'll draw a little bit of an analogy from a recent research paper that was just cited in the New York Times. And it's about salamanders. This is a good, good time of year to think about salamanders. Some of the, the more spectacular salamanders in Massachusetts are just laying their eggs. They're breeding now. And this one study found that because salamanders in forest floors, like turtles are in their wetlands, there are so many of them that the insects that they eat affect tremendously the way that leaves get recycled into the forest. And what that means is that a forest without salamanders seems to be much worse, for example, at trapping and keeping carbon in the soil. So if you kill all the salamanders, you wind up letting much more of the carbon that would otherwise be trapped in the forest soil up into the atmosphere, where, as we all know, it's changing our climate. So that's just one, set, one example of how animals that are really important, abundant parts of their ecosystem can affect things in very indirect ways that nobody mm -hmm. would have guessed. I like to use the analogy that um, animals like Blanding's turtles or musk turtles or the rare bog turtle that occurs in Massachusetts or spotted salamanders or all the plants that are around us, they are in many ways analogous to works of art. And th these are works of art though that have evolved over in many cases hundreds of millions of years. Turtles have been on the earth for more than 220 million years. They're unique in their own regard and to the same extent that we as people, we recognize, most of us recognize, not all of us, but most of us recognize that our lives are made richer by beautiful music, like whether it's Mozart or whether it's your favorite folk tune or by beautiful art. Also, the world is made richer by all these other species that we live with. There are a lot of problems 
around the world and for many of us we feel understandably um, hopeless about the situation and we know that I for example as one person living in Massachusetts there's not very much that I can do either about carbon emissions that are coming from China or from the Midwestern United States or for my pet issue about rare species there's not a lot that I'm going to do about snow leopards living here in Massachusetts but what I found is that when we've given people an opportunity to get involved in helping out a rare species that doesn't live in China or doesn't live in South America or doesn't live in Africa but lives here in Concord in their own town if they're people from Concord or in a different town that Blanding's turtles say occur in that that actually gives people a way to know that they are contributing to helping out a problem that is worldwide in its scope but they're helping out in their own place. Wherever you are, if you're interested, if you're interested in nature, if you're interested in plants and animals, you can help in one simple but really profound way, and that is find out about the environment around you, about some of the species that live near you, and as you start learning about some of the common species that live near you, you can also start to learn about some of the rare species. Some of the species that are going to need our help for them to stay around. So to still be around, say, when your students grow up or when our grandkids or something grow up. And you can find, for example, if you live in Massachusetts, you can go online, you can go to the website that the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife has. There's an endangered species program. And you can actually look up in your town, whether you live in Abington or you live in West Boylston or you live in Marlboro, you can find out what rare species live in your town, for example, or the surrounding towns. And you can learn what they look like mm. and keep an eye out for them or go looking for them or find out, find a biologist or a naturalist who knows about them. Because it turns out that most of the rare species that the biologists who work in the state know about, most of those observations don't come from people who work for the state. They come from other people who go out, see things, and report them. When the babies hatch out, we take a lot of those young, and we know because those the baby turtles are so small, right? They hatch out at about the size of a half dollar, about like this. They've got a soft little shell that protects them from nothing. Bullfrogs eat them, blue jays eat them, pretty much anything can eat them. Uh, your pet cat could swallow 20 of them and still be hungry. Mm -hmm. So what we do is then intervene once more in their lives in, with the intention of trying to help them survive to adulthood. So we take a lot of those babies and we raise them in captivity for nine months. And we call that head starting them. We're giving the turtles kind of a, a head start in life. And by doing that, by raising them indoors for about nine months, um, usually from about September to June, we keep them in a warm place where they feed a lot. They grow to about the size of a four or five year old wild wow. turtle. So when we get them, they're about like this. When we let them go, they're about like that. And they're about 20 times heavier with a much thicker shell, mm -hmm. much, much better able to protect themselves and much more likely to survive to adulthood. Mm. And we think that more than 20 times as many hatchlings that we head start will survive to adulthood than the ones that are just on their own. Wow. So we need people's help to do that. It's very labor intensive to raise the turtles. And we have, some of them are raised at the Stone Zoo and some of them are raised at the New England Aquarium. But the great majority of the turtles that we raise, both from here and from another population in Massachusetts, we raise in schools. And we need the help of the teachers, the students, to do all the care, to feed the turtles, to clean their tank, mm -hmm. to maintain them, and to record data on how the turtles are growing. In turn, we try and we usually do classes, so we teach people about the turtles, about their lives, about their ecology. We take most of the classes on field trips. 
I would say to anyone who's interested that please do contact me um, at Grassroots Wildlife Conservation and I can let you know if there are any possibilities to be involved with these particular projects or to be involved perhaps in other rare species conservation projects that might be closer to you. That's fantastic, Brian. Thank you so much for coming out today. You're welcome. I really appreciate, you know, not only that you did this for me, but all the stuff that you do around here in terms of conservation projects and everything. It's really impressive. Great. Well, it's great to meet you, and I hope that it works out for us to uh, bring some turtles over to Hillside next year.